I would much rather make a movie about a Daniel Johnston or a Johnny Paycheck than a Kurt Cobain. Stories of famous people are really tough to tell because we already know the story. I feel like when people are watching something and the cinema goes dark, or you're watching alone in your living room, it's all about story. Story is king. And then, no matter who it's about, if the story is great, it can hold you and entertain you and move you. That was a quote from Jeff Fiersig, a filmmaker, writer, music nerd, and my guest for this episode. He's interviewed Joey Ramone, John Hendricks, and the man that knocked down Muhammad Ali, Chuck Wepner. Jeff was given the Best Directing Award for Documentaries at the Sundance Film Festival for his 2005 film, The Devil and Daniel Johnston, a film that IndieWire named the best music documentary of the 21st century. Aside from Daniel, his films include The Real Rocky, Author, The J.T. Leroy Story, and Half Japanese, The Band That Would Be King. Jeff's subjects are mostly outsiders, people whose lives are engrossing, whose stories deserve to be told. They are people like Jeff Dowd, the real-life person that was the inspiration for The Dude from a little film called The Big Lebowski. Jeff Dowd, I've come to learn, was imprisoned for protesting the Vietnam War. The aggression, it turns out, did stand, at least for a little bit. To listen to Jeff speak about the legendary Stardust Cowboy, or Half Japanese, or Daniel Johnston, it might seem like he's talking about the greatest, most earth-shattering musical acts of all time. It seems like that, because to Jeff, they just might be. This is my conversation with Jeff Beardzig. I really hope you enjoy it, but more than that, I hope it inspires you to seek out his stuff, and maybe find your own stories to tell. So I've been listening to the Mo Tucker album that you did on the Joker Men podcast, and my mind is blown by this album. As I'm listening to it, I'm like, how do people not know? Like, everyone knows who Lou Reed is. How do people not know who Mo Tucker is? Well, I mean, you know, if you're a Velvet Underground fan, you obviously know who Mo Tucker is. So, right. you know, she's basically the greatest drummer of all time. Yeah. We're never told that. But it's the truth. Sure, yeah. And uh, that's not hyperbole. She's amazing. Oh, yeah. I agree. I agree. So I've been listening to a lot of your interviews, and I've been trying to, like, kind of get into this Jeff Fierzig like world. And I've noticed that you're a documentarian, you're a filmmaker, but a lot of the time you're talking about music. That would be, that'd, that'd be fair. <laughs> so I know you did uh, music DJing in college, right? Yeah, I was a college radio DJ at WTSR Trenton, 91.3 FM on left of the dial. But I was simultaneously a college radio DJ at WPRB Princeton, 103.3 right of the dial. Oh. So Princeton and Trenton were right down the road from each other. Okay. All right. So I was, not, I was not a Princeton student. I was a Trenton State College student. But it was a very small community of punk rock indie music people. And we all knew each other, so we would uh, trade shows, and that was a credible training ground because I was uh, I was not just a DJ there, by the way. I was a I was the production director. Okay. Therefore, that's where I learned how to edit and cut tape with razor blades. Awesome. <laughs> which was how I got started into film editing. So. Got it. And I would do the promos for City Gardens, like if the Ramones or or the replacements were coming, or you name it. I was in charge of making the promos, the radio ads to get people into this warehouse in Trent, New Jersey to see these bands. I would do the recordings and do the production and fade in the songs and cut the tape and go off and do interviews. My first interview, celebrity interview, interview was, was with Joey Ramone. Oh, City my Gardens. gosh. That's quite the first interview. <laughs> and I have, the, I have a photo to prove it. Nice, nice. So what came first for you? Punk came first, or was it the DJing that came first? How were you introduced to punk? Well, I got introduced to punk way before that happened. I mean, that, that was college, right? Yeah. So I'm born in 64, and uh, the first Pistols single is um, 
it's actually anarchy in the UK, but I bought the second one, and that was God Save the Queen as an import in Jersey at the mall. And I was 13. I believe that would be wow. early 77, if I'm correct. So at 13, that was a life-changing moment for me. And that was a line in the sand between me and my friends playing stickball. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, But, you know, I'd already been geeking out on The Who and Zeppelin and Sabbath and you name it. I, I was already geeking out for years way before that pistol showed up. So like, I probably started doing this when I was 10 or 11 years old. So I, I was an obsessive uh, young music geek. So you get the Sex Pistols second single. You're 13 years old. Does this come from like your parents or any older siblings? Not at all. My parents had no interest whatsoever in music, but believe it or not, my mom's People magazine had photos and articles about the Pistols. And that's where I learned about it. And then I, of course, had to have this thing. Wow, wow. And, um, but, you know, I was already, you know, riding my bike to the next town in Matawan because there was a 7-Eleven. So I was devouring, at the time, Cream Magazine, which had great writers like Lester Banks. I was devouring Circus Magazine, which was covering more of rock and metal more than, than underground stuff. And, you know, back then, Rolling Stone was still cool. Right. It wasn't cool for long, but it was. <laughs> and I was I was reading Hunter S. Thompson. And then my other obsession was um, National Lampoon. Mm -hmm. I, wasn't, I wasn't a Mad Magazine guy. I was a Lampoon guy. And I stand by that. Because Lampoon had incredible uh, short story writing. And uh, that's where John Hughes, who became a director, started. He was publishing incredible pieces of humor journalism and there's like four amazing ones that i still reference to people one was one was called my penis right right the other was called my vagina <laughs> another one was called a dog tail and the other one i think was called christmas of 59 yep, and yep. those were life-changing and there was another one called uh different writers actually uh oc and stigs which became a running series it ultimately became a uh, a Robert Altman film. It's a horrible Robert Altman film. The story was incredible, though. So there, there was just a lot of great stuff going on in the Lampoon. So there was, you know, there was an underground culture at the time that people in suburbia, you know, certainly weren't aware of. But yeah, yeah. I, as a very young kid, I was just like, this was this was like a secret world. And if you combine all those influences, you know, Thompson ultimately ultimately becomes a major influence on me with new journalism, which we'll talk about in a bit, but yeah, sure. But yeah, that's where that, that's where I sort of, that was my incubator. Nice. So when you went to school <laughs> in one of your other interviews, you said no one had ever heard of film school. Like that wasn't like a thing that existed. So you went to school for journalism. Not necessarily. I, I was a communications major cause I didn't know what else to take because yeah. <laughs> that encompassed journalism. Cause okay. I wrote for the college paper. That encompassed, uh, believe it or not, television production, but not film. Okay. So there was video. There was a cable studio where you learn three camera directing and lighting, and then you get a remote camera three quarter, and you're doing these remote shoots and you're editing videotape. No aesthetics whatsoever. But you know, I'm getting that. Yeah. That was great. And then of course we had the campus radio station, which I discovered. Now I didn't know about this when I when I got into college. I discovered it because it was in the basement, <laughs> and that was that, that. That you know, the radio, the journal, the newspaper was also in the basement, right next door. So when I found this, that you know, basically saved my life. Um, and then I, I had something to actually do that I enjoyed and meet a small community of people to do it with. And then of course, you know, this is already eighty two, eighty three, eighty four, eighty five. You know, the original punk rock was over. I was too young to be in it, even though I was taking part in it by reading about it and sure. buying all the records and listening. But it wasn't just punk rock. You know, I was uh, I was in Asbury. I was I was on the scene seeing Springsteen jamming in bars. Wow. You know, all before Nebraska, and we were seeing everything. So I had a very open mind. You know, you know Robert Gordon, rockabilly. I was seeing all kinds of things, not just you know punk rock. Yeah, that would be simplistic. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just I just kept an open mind. Loved a lot of things, and that was what I was doing. So you finished college, 
and you go to NYU for a six month program where your parents like, no like, no it was like a three month program it was like <laughs> one it was it was one I never said it was six months it was one semester it was called wow NYU's intensive filmmaking program and it was not at Tisch it was at the School of Continuing Education which Tisch looked down upon there was a film school you you brought it up you said you said that I said that people didn't talk about film school, which is very, very, very true. There was film school, but no one ever heard of it. No one ever said the words right. and put it together, film and school. It, there was one at NYU and there was one at UCLA, but there was no independent film movement and no one knew about this. Mm. I mean, if you knew about it, you probably, you know, I, obviously we ended, we ultimately learned that like Spike Lee went there and right. people like that, but you know, very few people knew about it. You know, it wasn't part of the culture at that time. And then it was all of a sudden, you know, in the eighties, you know, really happened with Jarmish first and Spike Lee. She's got to have it. So when Jarmish hit and Jarmish is in New York and he's on all, the, all of a sudden on the cover of the village voice, which, you know, the, the independent papers that I would devour, which everyone used to devour, cause that was the only way you would know what you were going to do, whether you were going to see a film or, or a band, like the only way to learn about it in your city, that's how you did it. So all of a sudden, Jarmish had Stranger Than Paradise, this black and white independent film with uh, no name actors. I mean, that's what that was a revelation. And then he had followed it up with Down by Law with one of the same actors, John Lurie, but then he added uh, Tom Waits and Roberto Benigni yeah. from Italy. And then all of a sudden, this guy is on the cover of The Voice. So I saw that at Trenton State, and I took the train into New York alone. And I planned a whole day to see Stranger Than Paradise down by law at two different theaters because wow. it was still playing. But I, I saw them in reverse because that's just how it worked out. So sure. you know, I was in the, I was like in the village doing down by law, you know, in the morning or around noon. And then later in the afternoon, I caught Stranger Than, Stranger Than Paradise at a different theater. And it, that was life changing for me. That just blew my brains out. And then I saw She's Got to Have It alone visiting a friend in college in D.C., and that was just like, oh, my God, right. there was a thing happening. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, when you combine that with punk rock and DIY, which I was already very immersed in, the DIY of it all made you want to go try to make films. Yeah. And that if you, that's sort of what that was the collision for me at that moment. Yeah, we grew up in a very like very DIY punk scene. And so watching your film Half Japanese, the band that would be Kane. And, you know, how they would create a mailing list and just send pieces of their guitar out. You contact the record presser yourself and say, hey, how much is the case to make this? And then you've got boxes of records around. You're like, well, now what do I do? That was very much the life that I grew up in. And a lot of the stuff in a lot of your films, not just the films about music, it feels very, like, homey to me. And hearing you talk about the magazines, especially, I don't know how much influence you have in the art direction in your films, but as a lover of punk scenes, I'm a lover of your movies. <laughs> you can see the aesthetic and the feel of all of that, all that you're talking about throughout your films. So were your parents like, you know, you're going, you're doing this intensive one semester. God, that's <laughs> crazy. But were they like into it? Or were they concerned for your financial future? Well, yeah. I mean, I'll tell you exactly what happened, all right? So basically, it's senior year, and I'm on this trip. And then I'm, once again, I'm already learning a lot of the things. I don't realize that it's going to be skills I need later, by the time, but, you know, by the way. So, you know, my dream at that time was like, oh, I want to be a comedy writer. I want to write for National Lampoon. Oh, Maybe I'll get a... Okay internship and like I can work for Saturday Night Live, which at that time was still cool. It wasn't so <laughs> right. has been cool for a long time, just like Rolling Stone. But whatever. Sure, sure. That's that's what those were the things I was thinking about, right? But then I saw, you know, be, you know, the when Jarmish hit and the American and the Coen brothers simultaneously with with Blood Simple, that was a that was a, a call to arms. And you wanted to be a part of that. And that's why I went to NYU's film school for the semester because like I didn't know I was going to do this. So there was a card on the wall that you signed up 
and they accepted, I think, 30 people from all around the world. I didn't even know I was going to get in. Wow. And so I was that whole summer. That whole summer, I sat around waiting tables and writing fake letters to the editor at National Lampoon, two of which, excuse me, three of which sold, <laughs> one got published. That was a big wow. deal. And, but anyway, the point was like, then I got to make film at NYU where you're actually taking the skills I had at Trenton State, the, the editing, the writing, the shooting, the directing. And now I'm cutting film, shooting film on a flatbed, you know, sleeping, you know, literally in the edit room under the edit table to finish these things black and white, 16 millimeter. And I'm learning all that. But the point is I had the skills from Trenton State. Now it's applying it to actual filmmaking, yeah, which yeah. is a whole new medium for me, which was great. So that's what happened. But that was America's French new wave. The American independent movement happened. But then what was interesting, and this, you know, that window of time, which was really exciting. This is like my producer of, of uh, Devil and Daniel Johnson. I should say my executive producer, Ted Hope, he showed up in New York for the same exact reasons. He was into the Minutemen and punk rock and DIY and loved it, this whole movement. And a lot of people just showed up in New York wanting to be a part of it. But then the window, the doors closed very, very quickly in that you couldn't write a screenplay and get it financed and made as cheap as John Irish and Spike Lee because all of a sudden you couldn't have no-name actors anymore. They all of a sudden wanted these new indie actor. So now you're taking these meetings, you're writing these screenplays, you're banging your head against the wall. It's very frustrating. And you realize, oh, even if I'm going to try to make a film for a couple hundred thousand dollars, where's that couple hundred thousand dollars coming from? Sure. So no, so nobody's writing that check. Right. right. And then I sort of had this idea. It was like documentary at that time, 80, 88, 89, was absolutely not respected, certainly not in Hollywood, and nobody watched them. And it was like PBS. It was like eat your vegetables. Mm -hmm. And I didn't respect that style of documentary. Yes, I truly did love Maisel's Pan and Baker, the sixties art. You know, great cinema verite, direct cinema people. Yeah. But that was like the sixties. It was already twenty years later, and nobody's doing anything interesting with this medium anymore. So I was like, oh, okay, hmm. I'll be that guy. I'll document my scene. I'll, I know how to make film. I, look, I just like storytelling. And that's what I started doing. And that's how Half Japanese, the band that would be king, came about. I was already editing and directing TV commercials. So I was making a living. That was like the first thing. Like, how do you make a living at this? Commercials was a great training ground for me. You know, I'm doing burgers chicken. You know, I'm doing pharmaceuticals. I'm doing political candidates. You name it, I shot it. Yeah. All right. A lot of corporations that I don't respect, but it was like Robin Hood mentality. mentality. Sure. You know, I'm doing Walmart commercials in Canada. I'm, I mean, I'm everywhere all over the United States shooting, editing, directing, but I'm learning. And I'm taking that money and I said, ah, I'm going to make this film about half Japanese. Because once again, at that time, which I started that film, that film came out in 93. I started the film in 1990. Nobody was filming these bands. MTV had already showed up and ruined music, yeah. and they were only doing music videos. So it was just like a lot of commercials for really bad music. So this, But there was this whole underground culture that I was a part of that was, in my opinion, and I stand by it, was like the great music of that decade. But nobody was filming it from a story point of view or documenting it right. like, you know, when the Stones and the Beatles and Hendrix showed up, like, you know, the Maisels and Pennebeck, everybody's there filming that stuff. They're there. They're getting documented. Not for my generation. It, it was a barrier because 60 millimeter was very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I took 30000 a year of my own money for three years, and I made half Japanese the band that would be king with that money. But then I did a DIY release of it. That film was made 100% independently and financed by me. Yeah. Because nobody, nobody was going to pay for it. And that was a way for me to make my calling card. And we opened at Film Forum in New York, which was my favorite cinema. I couldn't believe this happened. Yeah. We did a two-week run. And then I made an event out of it at the Knitting Factory right down the street on Houston Street. We did Half Japanese Alumni Weekend. So we brought in every iteration of Half Japanese with Jad and David Fair, the brothers. And... That was a way to promote, you know, 
the premiere two week run at Film Forum. So that was like super fun. The whole idea was to bring the fun. Yeah, right. Then then we schlepped these prints and shipped them all over the United States. Every great city in America, whether it was Chicago, Boston, San Francisco, Denver, uh, Toronto, you name it, they had a cool art house cinema. And they would still, believe it or not, show 16 millimeter prints. So we'd send the print, book these theaters, get the local arts paper. Chicago had the reader. L.A. had L.A. Weekly. Uh, Boston had its own. Every every city had it. You know, had its own arts paper, and we would get the ink, get the photos, and get you know. Sometimes we were film pick of the week with this thing, which was great because like we were up against Hollywood Films getting all this ink. Yeah. You know, L.A. Weekly had us as film pick of the week at the New Art, but to make it fun, to make it cool, to bring the fun, we would fly Jad in, Jad Fair, like Chuck Berry or Bo Diddley. And we couldn't afford the whole band, but we could afford one plane ticket. So we'd fly him in. And through the community of underground, we knew some other cool, you know, indie punk rock musicians. And we formed a band. They rehearsed for five minutes in the lobby. And when the credits rolled, the lights would come on and boom, there's Jad Fair. And he does a concert right in the theater. Like he just popped right off the screen. Yeah. And I got to tell you, we sold these cities out, man. It was fun. We, we would sell them out for a weekend, though. Like we, we didn't get a long run, but we would make a great event on a Friday, Saturday night in any given city. So that, for me, was just a blast, you know? I love it. Because distribution, <laughs> getting, this, getting these films out there, listen, making it was hard enough, trust me. Yeah, sure. Making it was really a struggle, I assure you. But getting it seen and getting it distributed and getting eyeballs and getting people to come and be, and to feel part of a community, a community of indie cinema, indie documentary, punk rock, call it whatever you want. It was all tied together. That's where you know your work doesn't end when you finish the film. You got you know what? Otherwise, it's a tree that fell in the forest and nobody heard it. So that that was what I did from ninety to ninety three with this whole background that I think we already discussed. I love the idea of like sitting through this documentary and then it becomes like, and here he is. <laughs> and it becomes like, you know, like hand in hand, a film and a performance. And the film is like extended and accentuated by this thing that you're now experiencing. You know, uh, for people who don't experience live music often, or, you know, I was fortunate enough to grow up near Broadway. I didn't go to Broadway all the time. I wasn't rich, but there's something about bringing something into the place where you're all sitting down. And I love that. I just, I think that's awesome. That's great. You had mentioned your Robin Hood mentality and Penn Jillette goes to great lengths in the documentary explaining how he used his Miami Vice money <laughs> and decided to produce these albums for artists that weren't having albums produced. And I think that that's a amazing and like a pretty great use of money. Looking at your filmography of stuff that's available, stuff that I was able to consume this week, I noticed there's like a through line in your stuff. And definitely I wrote down a quote of yours that I listened to like six times in a row to make sure that I got it exactly where you're talking about story and like story is what's important. Yeah. Telling the story of a famous person is great, but it's a story that we all know, you know? And if you can introduce someone to a story that they don't know, but it's a good story, it doesn't matter who that person is. For me, you know, I came across you from a trailer for The Devil and Dale Johnston back in the mid-2000s. I don't even know what film it was for, but the trailer came on and I was immediately, like, transfixed. And I remember thinking, like, wow, an entire documentary made up of home footage like how lucky could this guy be <laughs> being in a very musical family hearing the music in the trailer i was just like i have to see this movie i don't know anything about this person and like i don't know how i didn't hear of daniel johnson before this well it was very easy for you not to hear of <laughs> daniel johnson before this i assure you because nobody heard of daniel johnson before the film right. yeah uh, except for a very small amount of people in an underground sure, community. Sure, yeah. But that's not a surprise, I assure you. So there's no no foul there. Yeah. So you just mentioned, like, it's very hard to make the film, and then you have to keep working on it. So I'm not trying to put any restrictions on you or, like, how you pick your stuff, but 
Do you have a sense of like wanting to tell the story that isn't being told? Absolutely. I mean, but I like that you brought up the story thing because I prefer to talk about that more than anything. Yeah. Basically, the only reason we go to the movies is to be told a story, hopefully told mm-hmm. well. That's mm-hmm. that's all it is. It's storytelling. Right, right. And I tell everybody now because I, you know, certainly I, I lecture at film schools and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I say, hey, it's all about go to story school. Don't go to film school. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's that's my whole trip. That's where I'm really coming from. Like, you know, we talked about the punk rock thing and the DIY and indie American cinema. But the truth is the real epiphany happened for me with new journalism. Mm -hmm. And there's an article I tell everyone to read when I speak. It's called The Birth of the New Journalism by Tom Wolfe. And it was a great landmark article published in New York Magazine, not The New Yorker. And it's still up online. It was, I think, 72 when that published. But then a few years later, probably 75, he took the same article and made a whole anthology book of this movement. And when I read that article, it's really a manifesto, and I love manifestos. And in a nutshell, for our listeners here, I'll explain what happened here. So basically, Tom Wolfe is this writer, and he needs a gig, like all the writers. And Jimmy Breslin, he's working at either the New York Times or the New York Herald Tribune. They're working in newspapers. Yeah. But they're writers. And in the 40s and 50s in America, the novel was King, the great American novel. And everybody wanted to write the great American novel. That's what people wanted to do back then. So they had their literary heroes. It might have been Hemingway. It might have been Steinbeck, Faulkner, whoever. And that, But these guys needed a gig. Not that different than me needing a gig directing burger and chicken commercials. Yeah. And they got a job writing straight journalism at the Times, which is supposed to be fair and balanced and objective. And they felt very constrained by that style of writing. They had literary aspirations. So Wolf and a few of these other writers, Hunter S. Thompson, Terry Southern, Joan Didion, Joe Esterhaz, Robert Criscow before he became a music critic at the Village Voice, Jimmy Breslin, it's a long list. They all had different styles, but a similar idea at the same time. But it needed a tag, a movement, you know, in other words, everything does, you know, when the word punk rock happened, it wasn't like television sounded like the Buzzcocks or the (laughs) Ramones or the Clash. They all sounded different, but they had to call it something. Right. right. And the same thing happened with, you know, bebop or free jazz or loft jazz or hip hop, whatever. Tom Wolfe comes up with this idea. He doesn't even like the name, the new journalism. But what he did was he identified that, he wanted to write and use the creativity of no- novels were dead as far as he was concerned. It was a dead art form. Just the same way I was declaring PBS documentary in 1988, 89, a dead art form. Okay. And it was stale and old and moldy. And that's what Wolf was saying about the great American novel. So he focused on nonfiction, but nonfiction written, not objectively or fair and balanced with a point, a very strong point of view. And playing with first, second, and third person voices and playing with all the devices of great literary novels, but true stories. And that became a movement. So if you read this article, which is a manifesto, it's a call to arms. It's the same thing as punk rock. So I was like, ah, that's my idea. I like those ideas. I want to do that with this stale, boring, dead medium documentary at the time. You know, this PBS Eat Your Vegetables thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do whatever I want. So all the ideas that I had that were floating around in my head all end up, believe it or not, not in half Japanese. Half Japanese, I'm still a young filmmaker. I'm still figuring my thing out. Yeah. But with Devil and Daniel, I was able to take all these ideas, a kitchen sink of ideas, ghost recreations, uh, internal monologues of those cassettes, uh, Super 8 home movies, animation, you name it. But apply it to a three-act structure, which um, makes it feel just like you're watching a movie, yeah. not a documentary, not like chaptered or whatever. And all those are just ideas I had. And I didn't know if it was going to work, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> the point is, that's what yeah. I was doing. I was taking this new journalism thing. I loved all those writers. Yeah. And they're all different. Like Wolf blew my brains out. 
The Man in the White Suit. Everyone should read all his work, but all his early work is all nonfiction, all true story stuff. And, you know, I love already love Thompson since I was, you know, a young kid. But more importantly, discovering these other writers, like Joan Didion wrote very poetically, very different. She doesn't write anything like Tom Wolfe. Mm. And the same thing happened with um, Gay Talese. Oh, my God. Also was working in newspapers, felt constrained. Yeah. So Wolf started this new movement, and then that's what happened for a little while. It kicked the novel's ass hard. It became the thing. So hard that Norman Mailer joined up, who was a straight novelist, who worshipped Hemingway. And then all of a sudden, boom, he writes Army of the Night, and he never looked back and kept going on this whole new journalism trip. Terry Southern, forget about it. That was like one of my biggest obsessions, reading all his great work, twirling at Ole Miss. Anyway, if anyone who's listening feels like reading a great book, because it's just a bunch of great short stories, you could pick it up on Amazon, use for probably nothing. It's a Tom Wolfe, The Birth of the New Journalism, which starts with the manifesto and then goes into all these other writers, including his own work as well. So there's two great Wolfe pieces in there, um, Mau Mau and the Flat Catchers, really incredible. But anyway, what's the point? The point is that I was studying storytelling and writing and journalism. I always loved true stories. Yeah. So, so now it was like the game was not to f- f- focus on celebrities. The game was 100% to find the untold story. You know, the weirder, the crazier, the more interesting, the better. And I felt, first of all, obviously, I, I mean, I fell in love with Daniel Johnson's art and music yeah. in college. and But nobody knew who this guy was. And I was following his story. His story was incredible. And he also had things that I loved in his cassette tapes. He would record his mom yelling at him mm. and put it between the songs on the tapes. I thought, and, you know, an incredible sense of humor. Yeah. And I love humor. So he was doing all that. And it sounded to me, in my mind, at least back in like, you know, 85, 86, that was the king of comedy and Pumpkin in the basement and the mom yelling yeah, at him. Sure, sure. That was also that was also a Confederacy of Dunces. Yeah. You know, John Kennedy Tool and Ignatius J. Riley with that crazy mom relationship. So I had these cinematic things and literary things I loved, but I was seeing it in a true story with Daniel and his family and his mom and his Christianity, whatever. So that became like, oh, that's a great in my mind a great story. That's the story that has to be told. I'm going to make that film. And and the best part about that was that, you know, nobody else wanted to tell it. I assure you, nobody <laughs> wanted to get, get those rights. You know, I didn't have to go to battle, yeah, you know, sure. looking, you know, trying to option a book against some big Hollywood person right. with lots right. of money, with deep pockets. Nobody was interested in this. So, um, so Henry Rosenthal, my producer and I made the film and we, we did it like exploratory surgery. You know, we both wanted to make it. Henry discovered me in Berlin when he saw Half Japanese, the band that would be king, at my very first festival screening. And he shows up after the screening. He comes up to me. This guy has got tears in his eyes. He says, he goes, did you make this film? I said, yes, I did. He says, well, I grabbed my hands, clasped me. He says, you made this film just for me. Wow. He says to me. I was like, whoa. And we became pals. And ultimately, we... A couple of years later, decided to make the Daniel story. We, we talked about Daniel Johnson in 93 in Berlin that day when we first met. But Daniel didn't have a third act back then. So he had two mm. acts. Mm. He was already locked away in the mental hospital. No one had ever seen him tour because he couldn't tour. Right, right. And all of a sudden, Daniel showed us up, shows up in New York. I believe it was 2000. And I'd never even seen him. Like, I was, he was supposed to play in Hoboken where I live, which was all part of the WFMU underground independent music scene that I was a part of. And he played one day at Pier Platters, but he was supposed to play every night for a week mm. at Pier Platters, our local record store. Yeah, I was working, whatever, and I figured, oh, I'll catch Daniel the next day, and life is going to be good. Well, Daniel had a nervous breakdown and never played again wow. there, so I never got to see the guy. But that was better because he became a myth to all of us. And myth is great. Myth is good storytelling, right? So the myth of Daniel was even better than the, the actual guy. So anyway, what's the point? So Dan, so Daniel shows up in New York at the Knitting Factory, sold out. And now, you know, this, this skinny little high-pitched guy has gained a lot of weight, and he's got diabetes type 2, and he's shaking like a leaf. But when he's singing these songs of unrequited love, 
there was not a dry eye in the house, man. Yeah, I believe it. And I called, I called Henry. I said, hey, wow, Daniel Johnson has a third act. We, we, we got to start filming this guy. So we decided to do exploratory surgery. We both said, all right, because it's a risk. Making a film is a risk. We both threw $50,000 each down, and we flew to Texas for a month and got a crew, and we shot Super 60 millimeter, and we said, let's see what happens. And we felt like it was working. felt like it was clicking. You know, we felt, yeah, we didn't have a movie yet, I assure you. But we were like, all right, this is good. And then Henry, you know, he, him and I come out of this whole indie thing. He, he just kept going. And he, he, we made that film. That's the, you know, I'm, independent filmmaking is a, a big thing to me to still talk about. This was not a corporate made film. So, because nobody would pay for it. So Henry wrote a check for $1 million for me to make this film about Taylor Johnson. Wow. And people thought we were absolutely insane. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And we were like, oh, you know, you'll see. Yeah. I yeah. said, this story is incredible. We have to tell it. And th then we went to Sundance. We didn't even know we'd get into Sundance, but we got in. And then we did our first screening. And listen, this is the deal. When the, when the lights go out, your film either works or it doesn't work. Mm. People either laughed or cried or both, or they didn't. Mm -hmm. And this film just like buzzed out. Boom. And then there were distribution offers there. Thank God that was the dream because yeah. otherwise Henry lost a million dollars. And we made a deal at the end of the festival for a mass, you know, major distribution with Sony Pictures Classics. And at the end of the festival, I, I won the directing prize for documentary. And that's really what launched me to have an actual career. Yeah. So that's what happened. And then, you know, the film is still seen and shown around the world. And we, we, it's independent. We own it. We license it and sell it all over the world to this day. Wow. And that's great. Wow. So. You must be a... Uh... You must be a gambling man to take five years. <laughs> I heard you mention somewhere else that Daniel Johnson took about five years. Yeah, it was five years, but that was that was a fun five years for me because like I I went D Daniel's this incredible rabbit hole. Yeah, and I just went in the rabbit hole. You know, this is before there's even transcription software, so like you know his archive at the time, I still believe it was the biggest archive anyone had ever found and excavated. Yeah. So I would put the headphones on and transcribe everything myself Jeez. and just highlight what I thought was like gold mm. or okay or not, not useful and made this film by hand, you know, and just figured it out. But that was so much fun because being inside his brain and creativity, that was just, a, that, that was, that's my sandbox. Yeah. So that was cool. I mean, you know, it took five years cause that's what it took. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because uh, it was massive as far as trying to figure it out and get it right. Yeah. I mean, with a lifetime archive, I imagine you could take like 10 directions. You know what I mean? Like you're wanting to tell a story and I think it does. I mean, obviously I'm a big fan of the film and I think to see the film is to love the film. I was a really big like, hey, everybody come over. I'm going to show you this movie with the Daniel Johnson documentary. Because I knew a lot of creative people, non-creative people who were just like into music. And for years, I just, have you seen this movie? Have you seen this movie? I, you, I would buy copies of it when I saw it, and I would loan it out to more people. I probably loaned out like three copies of this that have never come back. But anyway, I imagine with this much information, it's not like what story to tell. It's like which story to tell. Yeah, well, you know, once again, I, could, I think the quote, that I always tell everybody is story is king. Yeah. And that's it. And I stand by it. So if you could tell me a great story, then, you know, I'm in and tell it in a unique way, even better. But tell me about something I don't know. Yeah. You know, I don't need to hear, you know, some celebrity puff piece that's just because they're famous. Like that, they might not have a great story just because they're famous. Sure. That's yeah. the truth. I mean, some might, right. but <laughs> my whole trip is finding this, the untold story. Like, you're like out prospecting and you're you know, like at the beach with uh, that metal detector. You're just trying to, you know, and I'm reading articles and books and things all the time and just trying to find that great story that really, that I want to spend years of my life on, you know, that I, that I feel is worth telling that could be a film. So, you know, JT Leroy was, you know, author of the JT Leroy story, The Real Rocky. These are all personal stories that I felt like I wanted to make films out of and tell. And they're, you know, they're very different films. One's about, 
a boxer from yeah, my childhood. Sure. JT Leroy was, you know, a literary scandal. You know, I thought that was a whole different trip, not music, you know, but this punk rock in it, of course, as you sure. saw. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm just out always looking for a great story. Yeah. And like, I certainly don't want to pigeonhole you. And if you're listening to this and you're not familiar with Jeff's work, first of all, get familiar with it. But it's not all like punk documentaries, you know, like I do think, though, and it might just be because I've been like submerged in the work of Jeff Fierzig for like a week. (laughs) I see the through line and like one of the through lines that I see, like we end the half Japanese doc on this very gleeful moment. And I'm not going to say what it is because it's so great. (laughs) You should really experience it. But like even author, which, you know, check out the movie author jt Leroy. if you want to watch a movie that will rearrange your brain and understand it of what's going on in the world watch that movie i likened it to three identical strangers i don't know if you've seen that one yeah so i enjoyed it yeah yeah i was having the same experience of like okay you know i know that the world that i see that's presented to me is not exactly reality but i didn't realize that there were the other reality was like this reality is what's really happening. But yeah, like there's definitely like a through line of happiness and joy in some of these stories that are really heavy, really, really dark. And I think it makes the stories much more palatable. Like if you tell the story of half Japanese and it's just a story about aspiration and ambition that doesn't necessarily become fulfilled, it's a dark story. And I don't know that people, I don't know that people are so in tune to the music of half Japanese that they're willing to like sit through that experience. But there's not really a question in what I'm saying. I'm just trying to say you do a really good job with your films and I really enjoy them. Um, thank you. Yeah. Really quickly. Cause I want to make sure that we're, you know, staying within our time frame. but the JT Leroy story, how long did you work on that? How did that come out? Well, that was shorter because I was financed. I remember with devil, we did it over four and a half, five years. I was still directing commercials all the time to pay for it. Mm-hmm. But Henry was paying, so it was I still had to make a living, you know, whatever. It took whatever it took. Now I sort of also refined my process a little bit, and I was actually financed. It was still independent because we didn't pre-sell the film, but some people from Hollywood had stepped up for me on that one. And um, it actually got made in about a year and a half, although... You know, I was schlepping that story around to financiers unsuccessfully yeah. for probably two and a half, three years. Wow. wow. So, you know, the whole indie producer financing thing that I really fell in love with during the American indie uh, explosion that I jumped into, that kind of disappeared when Silicon Valley and the Internet took over. And then all of a sudden, documentaries became this hot thing that people actually watch and talk about more than Hollywood films that are, you know, indie films that are packaged with stars. Even if you, you know, that's why probably you have this podcast. I mean, people love, you know, true stories, but more important, they love truth is strange than fiction stories. But anyway, the point is that it got a little corporatized, this whole thing. That's why there's so many celebrity docs because they'll finance that. Oh, they're famous. Let's pay for that. (laughs) But it's, it's tougher still to make, the type of indie docs about stories you haven't heard that I make and a few other people make. So yes. So, you know, it's, it's better to, you know, it's a good time for documentary. Thank God, but don't pretend for one second. It's actually easier. It's not. So um, what was the point I was trying to make that basically getting the money for the story, the JT Leroy story was not easy. Uh, And when you're pitching Silicon Valley people, you know, they're just thinking about like, the next internet website stock like pet.com <laughs> that they can make a billion dollars from. They don't really actually like cinema or right. storytelling right. or read books yeah. or, you know, like music, <laughs> you know, it's just like, a, it's just a consumer product to them. That's why they've eviscerated all the above. Yeah. You know, that's why Spotify doesn't pay artists. You know, they don't love music. So anyway, it's very tough to pitch these people and, walk away with you know a million and a half bucks to go make this film but eventually i put the money together but i thought it was an incredible story i didn't actually know the story when it hit a great friend of mine a journalist paul cullum turned me on to it and what it had i was like oh let me he says you might you might like this 
This was after the real Rocky. He's like, you know, this was like the big, it was, it was labeled the biggest literary hoax in history. And it was New York Times. It was New Yorker. It was Salon.com. It was big, giant Vanity Fair article. And I read them all. And I was like, this is an incredible story. But the person who had actually written the books was not interviewed in any of them. And this was, of course, Laura Albert. Yeah. So she had never told her story. She held it back. And she knew how valuable the story was. So I said to my buddy Paul, I was like, hey, you know what? I think there's a lot more to this story that we're not being told here. And so I reached out to, to Laura Albert and found her in San Francisco. And she watched The Devil and Daniel Johnston. And, you know, as I came to learn, she also came out of the punk rock, hardcore punk yeah. scene in, in New York. I didn't know this, of course. And she saw the film and she said, you know, now you got to realize something, you know, at that point in time, Hollywood came knocking on her door and wanted her rights. So Harvey Weinstein wanted to make that film. A lot of people did. And she said no to everybody. Turned down a lot of money. So she said, I want to make the film with you because a you're punk rock <laughs> and b and b you're a jew yeah. which is you know <laughs> both true yeah and, and you know she didn't want a penny from me and i also don't believe in paying my subjects by the way because mm -hmm. it's journalism yeah anyway so then, then i then it's a couple of years to raise the money and she she had an incredible archive that rivaled daniel johnston's of self-documentation. Yeah, yeah. You know, photos, audio, video, film, Super 8, things I love. So, yeah, all of a sudden I'm back with a giant archive and made that film. And, I'm, you know, I'm very proud of that film. Oh, well, you should be. It's amazing. And especially something I didn't notice until I heard you mention it was, like, the way that the film reveals itself, the further in that you go, that was just, it was genius. Really well, great storytelling. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful storytelling, and it's the kind of thing where you start off and you think you know what's happening, and right up until the final moments, it's like you really don't know <laughs> what's happening. And I was like you, like when this whole thing was happening, like in real time, in real life, completely unaware of it. And so when you're watching the documentary and you're having different people, you know, different famous people are showing up, and you're like, huh, wait a minute, this isn't like a story that's off on another planet. This is happening here with people that you know and just underneath the surface a little bit and very revelatory. Yeah, really wide, crazy. Well, cool. I don't, you know, I don't want to give it away because... Nope, definitely you know, not. <laughs> there's, a, there's a story there. We never want to do... We don't, just, we don't want to do spoilers. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, there's a, there's a, that's quite a story. <laughs> um, and that's why I decided that would be... A, I thought it would be a good film Yeah, you know, to make, so... So another one of your docs that I watched this week was uh, The Real Rocky. And being a big fan of at least the first two Rocky films, this was another like eye-opening kind of... It's like when you get a new phone and you leave the film on and there's all these fingerprints on it and then eventually you pull it off and you're like, oh, there's this thing underneath. It just felt like the pulling back of like the curtain and you know, the pulling back of the narrative of like what we think we know about Rocky and still on writes the whole thing and how much of this is legend, you know, who knows, but like he writes the whole screenplay in one day or like one night. And it's the whole story of, you know, Rocky in Hollywood and nobody's taking Stallone seriously. And now boom, you have to take this guy seriously. And then to find out that like, there's a lot more to this story. <laughs> It was just really eye-opening. Well, thank you. So did you find that story? Like, he's local to Jersey. You're raised in North Jersey. Did you approach ESPN? Or, like, what? how did that come about? Well, it's a fun story of how that happened. So here we go. <laughs> so basically, when I started making this, there was no such thing as ESPN 30 for 30. So that doesn't matter. Yeah. This was a personal story from my youth. I'm actually from central Jersey, Monmouth County. Okay. Bayonne is near New York City, but it might as well be 100 million miles away because the PATH train doesn't stop there as it does stop in Hoboken in Jersey City. So anyway, when I was, um, I think, uh, 11 years old, Chuck Wepner, a.k.a. the Bayonne Bleeder, uh, was about to fight the great Ali 
And believe it or not, my high school, which I'd never been to, I was still in grammar school, had sports night. Once a year, they would spend some money and bring in a big sports celebrity. They had like Ed Crane pool from the, from the Mets one year. This year they decided, oh, we're going to have Chuck Wepner, the Bam Bleeder. I'm like, yeah, great. Wow. So my dad, my dad took my younger brother and I to the high school. I'd never been to the high school. And it was this big night, and Chuck Wepner is about to fight Ali. So he's not even famous yet. And he shows up in this long fur coat and like a pimp hat. <laughs> and he's showing his fight film, 16 millimeter black and white, where he fights the great Sonny Liston, which, you know, as you see in my film later, is the is the bloodiest fight yeah. in boxing history. And this guy was amazing. And he was very inspiring. So at the end of this speech films for the, all the dads and the kids and the sons in the audience, you know, he's about to go off to the Catskills and train his ass off to fight the great Muhammad Ali. And no one knew, of course, if he would win, but he was convinced he was going to win. So he's a local liquor salesman. He never trained full time for a fight in his life. Yeah. And he finally gets this big opportunity. And, um, you know, obviously I, I, we were watching all the Ali fights back then. I love the fights. I mean, those were, those were, that was like that and evil Knievel capture our imaginations yeah, in sure. the early seventies. That was like so fun. So anyway, you know, he, he obviously fought Ali and he goes 15 rounds with the great Ali. And of course in the last eight seconds, Ali boom, knocks him out finish them off but he's still a champ he's still a hero because if you're from bayonne new jersey just to be in the ring with the great ali that's already a win and that's what the beautiful symbolism of wepner was you'll fight ali and go 15 rounds ali as you see in my film didn't take the fight seriously he'd just come off of uh, the rumble in the jungle had a tough fight and he wanted an easy fight so he picks this liquor salesman remember he was a rated ranked fighter yeah. chuck weapon was far from a nobody right right and he was actually the heavyweight champ of new jersey which is very significant anyway so ollie picks him and he doesn't train that hard and he comes he shows up kind of fat and flabby but weapner trained his ass off and he's a big guy and he's you know the reason he's the bayon bleeder he had the greatest nickname in fight history of course <laughs> is that the guy would not go down this guy could take punches this guy would just bleed bleed yeah. bleed so you know Ali. He learned a quick lesson by round three, like, oh, my, sh holy shit, this guy's, this is not going to be easy. I can't knock this guy out. Right. So he, he then punishes Ali for all these rounds, and it's something to watch. And then Wepner even knocks him down, which is unheard of. Very few people have ever knocked Ali down. Now, of course, Wepner fights dirty. That's like, you know, his signature, he's <laughs> Bayonne, you know, he's a street fighter. So he stepped on Ali's foot, which is fantastic, yeah. even better. So everything about this guy's great. Right, right. So I loved him. So when I finished Devil and Daniel Johnston, I had I was a giant fan of the Nick Toshis books, the great novelist. I did become friendly with Nick during that time in New York, and we would have dinners and lunch and whatever and hang out, whatever. But the point was he had a brand new book out called The Devil and Sonny Liston. Mm. So I read this book. And it's a great book, but boy, it's really dark. And I'm like, ah, you know, I'm not quite sure. I want to go on this dark trip. Yeah. But the last two pages of it, Nick is from Newark, New Jersey. And the last two pages are all about Chuck Wepner, the Bayonne bleeder. I was like, aha. So I called Nick. I said, hey, Nick, what do you think about a, a documentary about Chuck Wepner, the Bayonne bleeder? And he says, that would be a great fucking documentary. <laughs> and he gives me Wepner's cell phone number. So I dial up Wepner. And I caught him in the middle of his liquor route. He was in like in Jersey City wow. making his rounds. Well, I was late. I got to the guy like a month late. He was just suing Stallone after like 30,000 years, oh, finally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and someone else had gotten his rights. I was like, ah, shit, I lost. But I now had Hollywood agents. And I told my agents like, hey. This is this guy, Mike Tolan. He's got the rights to this Chuck Weapon. He goes, oh, really? Mike Tolan, he's a great guy. We represent him also. <laughs> I was like, really? So all of a sudden, boom, I'm in a meeting with Mike Tolan. And it went well, and he wanted to make a Chuck Webner film, and so did I. So we joined forces on this. Wow. And then ultimately, and I started filming it. He, you know, he, he went out of pocket and just put me and my Devil and Daniel crew in Bayonne for like a month shooting Super 16 again. We knocked that film out in like a month. 
Wow. And it was a great, sh- it was a great shoot. Uh, you know, I was feeling good and I, Weapon was great and his family was great. And, you know, I had fun doing this Woody Allen, Broadway, Danny Rose Greek <laughs> chorus, yeah. which was like, that's what I'm really proud of in that film. That, yeah, that part is, that part's a pretty great. Amazing. Well, I love Woody Allen's films. It was a huge influence on me. Yeah. But anyway, but that film sat in a can for like five years. Jeez. Unedited, by the way. We didn't have the money to finish it. And then Mike became the producer of the first season of the 30 for 30 series and it became a smash thing on espn now i'm not a sports guy by the way but i love a good story and i love boxing so anyway boom and then we sold it to espn and we made and i just went in an edit room for like i don't know five six months boom we got a film but you know that's a tv hour not a feature it's 50 minutes you know that became its own thing and then uh, lee f schreiber got attached and I was supposed to that direct that as my first narrative Hollywood film because I was writing screenplays and whatever. Yeah. And um, we couldn't get the money for Liev, even though he'd been in a few films, people wouldn't finance him. So it just took forever. And then all of a sudden he got popular on this TV show, Ray Donovan. Yep. And all of a sudden people would finance him. <laughs> so I get a phone call one day and it's Mike Tolan. Now we'd already, re- I'd written the screenplay. We'd made the documentary <laughs> And it's all Jersey humor. And, you know, I was excited. I, you know, I, I, I would throw my hat in the ring and sure. direct a narrative film. I'm, I'm okay with that. And, uh, and no one knows if it'll be any good, by the way. But there's no harm, no foul, because most films aren't very good. But I figure I'll try. And if I <laughs> fail, I fail. And maybe it'll be good, right? Anyway, yeah. Mike's like, you won't believe this. We have the financing for the real Rocky narrative film. It was called The Bayon Bleeder at the time with Liev. And he's like, are you available? He's got a window between Ray Donovan and his season, I think, in the fall. I said, no, I'm not available. I'm booked for the next year and a half on oh. author of the J.T. Leroy story. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. So, wow. Um, so th- th- someone else directed it, and that was the end of that. And welcome to Hollywood. So yeah. That's how it went. But um, anyway, that's the story of, uh, of the real Rocky. Wow. Which you can get on Amazon and rent it still. It's available out there. Yeah. Definitely check it out. I'm also not a sports person. Like, I'm really into music and I'm into movies and definitely one of my biggest blind spots is sports films. So I just recently watched Rocky. Like, I, I watched the whole series this year. I, I stopped at four. But I watched this for the first time as, like, a 30-something-year-old person, which is a lot older than people normally do. And people will be like, hey, have you seen, like, Bull Durham? <laughs> I'm like, no. You know, Field of Dreams or... No, the first, the first, the first, the first Rocky's great. Yeah. It yeah. really is. And it is, and I, I loved it when it came out. But, you know, once again, I don't want to ruin the story, but it, this is the story of the real Rocky. Yeah. And let's just leave it at that. And it's very humorous. I think it's a pretty funny film. So, Yeah, definitely. I love what you did with Weppner. Like, he's got such a distinct, like, older boxer face. And you're doing these really tight close-ups you feel like you're sitting there talking with him, like right next to him as he's telling the story. And he's not talking really loud. You know, it's not uncomfortable. It's not like big brother. ish. <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Cause like, that's the other thing now, you know, these films that we're talking about that I got to make or, you know, for the most part, biographical they happened in the past tense. I don't make verite films, even yeah. though I love the Maisels and I worked with Albert. Sure. Yeah. You know, I'm not making great gardens here, you know, and I love those films, but that's just not what I do. So it's really tough because, you know, I've, audiences have been telling me this forever, and I agree with them that they're they're really wearied and tired of traditional talking head documentaries. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so and I'm doing anything I can to subvert that. So Wepner, of course, is shot, I believe, in documentary history, the tightest shot ever for an interview. <laughs> it's eyebrowed it chin black and white um and i thought that was a fun idea to subvert the talking head right and i'm glad you brought up because i'm proud of it and i like it and people seem to like it so that's cool i'm doing it now in my new film which i'm not allowed to talk about sure because it's not announced yet so anyway yeah very cool well yeah so like you know even author of the jt the roy story is a unique way to shoot uh, ultimately a a talking head (laughs) but you know it was very much inspired by my favorite Errol Morris film, Tabloid, which I love, which yeah. was produced by Mark Lipson, who's a genius. Uh, he also produced The Thin Blue Line, which blew my brains out. You know, I love Errol's oh, film. 
Um, <laughs> I, I went on like a, a big Errol Morris binge and I was just like, I need every story to be told by this man. <laughs> well, tabloid's great. So tabloid was a pretty big influence on author the JT the Royce. Yeah. Story. It's just, it's, you know, it's funny. Right. It's a great story that no one's ever heard of. It, I love the way he handles archive. I just think it's, you know, it's a brilliant film. Yeah. So you are one of my favorite people on Instagram because you're constantly highlighting like interesting things that are currently happening, like in music and in performance. And I think you're like repeating tagline is like the scene is alive or something like that. Uh, but yeah, I just, I really appreciate, you know, like myself growing up as a punk and knowing a little bit about your story and, it's just nice that someone is out there who's like telling the stories that aren't being told. So do you have any recommendations for the listeners of like things that maybe they haven't heard of? Sure. I have this list. It's kind of like my list with Henry Rosenthal, the producer of devil and Daniel Johnson, and also a producer and author of the JT Roy story, by the way. Right. Of crime fame. Right. (laughs) Of, well, he was Hank rank, the drummer of San Francisco's first punk rock band crime. Yeah. Of course, uh, covered by Sonic Youth years later, uh, Hot Wire My Heart. Sure, yep. yep. Um, but yes, uh, we have this list that no one really, some, some of these films people have heard of, but, and, and, but a lot of them people don't talk about. But these are our films, because anybody could give the same list of favorite documentaries that everyone else talks okay, about. Sure. So what's the point? If you already saw them already or heard about them, we're going to give you the other list. All right. All right? Cool. So here we, here we go. I would say this might be one of my favorite documentaries ever made. Maybe we can crowdsource this here on your podcast. It's been taken down on YouTube, and I never ripped it. I took it for granted. Wow. So I can't actually watch it again, and it's killing me. It's called Kiss in Cadillac, Michigan, 1975. Wow, okay. And it's a short documentary. Now, don't be fooled if you Google this on YouTube, and you will see other Kiss in Cadillac, Michigan, 1975 documentaries that are horrible produced by the Kiss team. Okay. This was not produced by the Kiss team, okay? And I think Gene Simmons had it taken down, and now I can't get my hands on it. I've tried the Internet Archive. Maybe someone ripped it. Maybe there's a Kiss fan out there. Now, once again, it doesn't matter what you think of Kiss. Yeah. It's just an incredible story and great filmmaking. And I don't even know who the director is. No one does. Wow. It wasn't made like it, – it's just this lost little masterpiece. So maybe someone out there listening could somehow find someone who ripped it. We can share it. I, uh, it, it should be shown in museums. That's how great wow. this thing is. Oh, wow. So I'll give you a little setup on what that film is. So Kiss, at the height of their moment when they're happening, which is, is of course – when Kiss Alive hits, they they uh, fly into Michigan like a publicity stunt. They take over this high school. There's a lot of photos online, but that doesn't mean like you saw the film. And all the principals and the football team and the cheerleaders are wearing Kiss makeup, and they play a concert in the high school gymnasium. And you've never seen anything like it. And the guy telling it is telling it over a phone recording, which I love. So it's like part of that is the aesthetic of what that is. It was shot on film. It's unbelievable how great this film is. So people should seek that out and try to find it. And if you watch the lesser versions of it produced by, like, you know, the Kiss bonus team that's on YouTube, you know, you might you might think you saw the film, but you didn't because that's how it is. Another great film. Ready? Here we go. Okay. Deep Water. It's a British film about a boat race around the world. Incredible. Okay. Okay. Mind-blowing film. Great film. Give you another one. This is only available on the director's website. It's not available streaming anywhere, which I love because it's an indie film and you know, maybe it's seven, eight bucks. You pay the director and he gets paid. That's great, sure, right? Sure. This is called Rockaterania by Brett Ingram, 2009, 74 minutes. Okay. It's available at Springwood Laboratories.vhx.tv slash product slash Rockaterania. Let me spell it for you. R-O-C-A-T-E-R-R-A-N-I-A. It has nothing to do with rock or music. Wow. Okay. What a film. All right. Wow. Okay. It's a handmade, amazing film. Uh, another film that people should all see is The Greatest by William Klein, which is a Muhammad Ali early documentary. Everybody thinks 
when they were kings is the great Ali yeah, film. Right, right. It's not. This is the better Ali film, the greatest by Ali. Now, be careful when you Google that up. There's a Hollywood film called The Greatest, starring, <laughs> believe it or not, Ali as himself. But that's wow. not the film we're talking about. We're talking about the documentary oh, wow. by wow. William Klein. Okay. So here we go. Another film that people still should talk about, and it seems to have gotten lost, Crazy Love documentary. Crazy Love. Great true story. Love it. Obviously, we've all seen Crumb, but Crumb's a great film. Terry Zweigoff. Sure. see Crumb. Of course. Yeah. Uh, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's give it up for, of course, we've all seen it, American Movie. Great film. Yes. <laughs> great film. <laughs> Yesterday was Thanksgiving, and me and my brother were talking about a lot about American Movie. And yeah, one of the best scenes in the film, Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah Chris Smith. Great film. Uh, I, I really love uh, Brett Morgan's uh, Rolling Stones documentary called Crossfire Hurricane. Okay. Uh, very much worth seeing because there's no talking heads. So Brett did some really did a really original, cool idea there. And you know the Stones are really old; they're old prunes. Nobody wants to look at them. So he just recorded them. But you know who's talking and telling the story. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. I also love a very. Uh, it's a lost film that was found. It's about the Stones. It's called Charlie Is My Darling. Great documentary. And if you watch it back to back with with uh, the Bob Dylan Pennebaker film, Don't Look Back, I would argue that Charlie is My Darling is the better film. Wow. And they're both great. And they're both great. Wow. I love yeah. Don't Look Back. And I love Dylan. Salesman by the Mazels. If yeah, you already sure. love Great Gardens, you got to see Salesman. Absolutely. As are my, well, there's, there's one other one, but you'll never find it. It's called Based on a True Story, okay. The Real Dog Day Afternoon. Ooh. Now, okay. if you Google that, there's an American version, but that's not the same film. And that's pretty good, that film. This one, believe it or not, was like made in like Sweden. And I have a link to it, up, but you'll never find it. But boy, it's great. <laughs> okay. Wow. Awesome. Well, I, uh, I can't tell you enough how grateful I am that you took your time out to talk to me. And this is like, uh, you know... <laughs> I don't want to be weird, but, you know, I'm just very grateful that you took your time out to talk to me. Very grateful for your work. Love your stuff. If you're listening to this and you're not familiar with Jeff's stuff, I'm not sure how. But if you're not, check out The Devil and Daniel Johnson. Check out Author, the JT Leroy story. Amazing stories told by a very talented hand. And I can't wait for what's coming next. I know we can't talk about it, but... Looking forward to it. Well, Seth, I really do appreciate you having me on and you took the time to watch all this stuff. And um, that's so cool. Of so course, um, yeah. it's fun for me to share and turn people on to cool stuff. And, yeah. you know, I'm happy to be on your podcast. Um, so thank you. Hey, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you so much to Jeff for giving up his time and being so gracious. We had some technical issues that hopefully you won't notice if my editing uh, works. And he was very cool about everything. Author, the J.T. Leroy story, is currently streaming on Prime. And you should rent The Devil and Daniel Johnson or just buy the DVD wherever you can. You can also find a lot of Jeff's other stuff on Vimeo. Thank you for listening. Have a good one. Movie Friends is produced by Seth Vargas and Michelle Rubenstein. Music by Anthony Bacora. If you like the show, please subscribe and give us a rating. It really helps us find new friends. Thanks.